of Inside Great Lakes Sailing. My name is Greg Norman. We've got quite a treat today. We are talking with Harry Jones. And uh, Harry, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and your group, and then we can kind of talk because I think there's a number of titles that have to be explained that I'm not sure I can at this moment. <laughs> sure, sure. You, you're not the only one. Uh, thanks, thanks for inviting me. This is a great, great opportunity. Uh, again, my, my name's Harry Jones. Um, my working title is the director of the Challenge to Win Youth Sailing Program. Um, I've been involved with them for 10 years. Uh, it was started 20 some odd years ago by the Greyhaven Sail Club. And, um, and a couple of years ago, the Challenge to Win Board, which I'm the president of, that's another title, uh, we started talking about how do we sustain the youth program. Long story short, we decided we needed to um, broaden, expand the Challenge the Wind program into a broader program that would include adult sailing. And we really, we always thought of ourselves as a community sailing program, but this gave us the opportunity to, for once and for all, establish ourselves as a Detroit Community Sailing Center. So the structure that we're working towards, and this is all new this year, um, we announced it, the structure will be, we'll have a youth sailing component. We'll continue to call that Challenge the Win. And we'll have the adult sailing part of it. And I can get into this later, but the Detroit Boat Club, um, um, the sailing club that was at Edison, they're the ones that are going to provide the adult sailing component to it. But uh, we can get into that in more detail. Losing Edison was a, was a huge um unfortunately just a huge setback i think in a lot of ways i think people are finding their way but yeah. I, think, I don't think we realized all of us realized how much edison meant just in terms of proximity and what they did and, and as long as they were there so you know i guess my yeah, first I, always, I always looked at it as, as sort of the crossroads between a lot of clubs and organizations would meet there i mean that they, they had a nice dining room yeah. um club clubhouse and um um You'd, you'd go there and uh, meet up with people from other clubs, and uh, it was just a great environment. I didn't think much about it until we have, I'm, I belong to Crescent, and then all of a sudden we get to about September, and people who had kept their boats at Edison for years all of a sudden right. start scrambling to try to figure out, you know, where they're going to take you know, boats and things for the winter. So it was, it, it, yeah, we've, we're settled, and we kind of move forward. I guess to start with, talk a little bit about Challenge the Wind, and then talk a little bit about what your target audience and, and really who are you servicing in that program? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, um, one thing we're thought of as a, a junior sailing program, a youth sailing program, the, the DRY you know, treats us as one of the programs, but we are a bit different. Um, we got started um, um, out of the Greyhaven Sail Club um, some members, this was before me, I won't take credit for it, before me looked at you know, the, the, the complexion of people sailing um, on the uh, river in, the, in Lake St. Clair and thought, you know, maybe you know, we'd like to see more of, quote, us and, and uh, decided to do something about it. And so when they started the Great Haven Sail Club, one of their missions was to introduce sailing to young people that would otherwise never get the opportunity. That mission still lasts, has survived, it is intact today, and we're expanding it. Um, we have worked hard to uh, make our program affordable. We charge a ridiculously low amount, $100 for two weeks to uh, learn to sail. 
um, which is which which helps us get through the hurdle of I might be interested but I can't afford it or um, if it would be too expensive we'd have a lot of our target audience drop out just because of the cost of it so so we work hard to raise money to keep the um, the, the fees down for the youth program and we've been successful in that when I started with the program and it's funny how I got involved with the program because um, me and another guy good friend of mine Cliff Papen who who um, had a, an ex-yacht that he kept at Bayview and I would crew on his boat and he participated in I don't know one of the evening weekend races I don't remember which one but he and I talked about how the youth program was sort of falling apart and um, that we said well we ought to do something about that or, or someone should do something about that that ended up being us and uh, long story short I then became take over the whole program and started running it and when I started we had I went to the boys and girls club and talked to them got them to give us eight kids we had two flying scots that was our fleet two flying scots <laughs> we we got we got uh, one of the kids had to drop out for one reason or the other so we ended up me and another uh, guy uh instructor uh we had seven kids in our first class and that was like 11 years ago um now we're set up, up that we've got i think in the neighborhood of 26 boats. Um, we have um, the capacity to do 80 two-week programs, two-week for kids programs. So, um, you know, some kids sign up for multiple um, right. week uh, sessions. Right. Um, but so we look at what our capacity is and, and um, just this until the coronavirus thing hit, we were, um, uh, opened up our registration and within three weeks we were almost 70 percent filled with with uh, paid participants so we found a way to working with the local Detroit schools and various other organizations to attract a group of people that um, would otherwise never get involved in sailing. What do you think the hurdle for you providing an urban environment for sailing is it just unobtainable to some folks what do you think the biggest hurdle is facing i mean you're obviously attracting bodies but would you typically think of sailing in an urban community i guess maybe that's yeah no that's it's you know it's 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 not something that um our families our participants families um are around some of them around boating mostly fishing uh very few black sailors uh, in the universe uh, to begin with, so they don't see a role model. And then what's made it more challenging lately is the NFL and the NBA and with Tiger Woods playing golf, um, the Serena sisters playing tennis. You know, the other sports have really dominated the, uh, the mindset. Uh, so that's, that's a challenge. And once we get our our um, opportunity out there and present um, you know the ability to get under the water to do something quite different be unique uh, we've got a number of other hurdles none the least of which is a lot of our community they don't swim um, a lot of our community the parents particularly the moms are deathly afraid of water and um, um, and there's the whole as folks in our community will understand the women and the hair thing that gets in the way of being on the water or around the water. So we have a lot of, uh, just the sheer fact of you're gonna take my little kid and put him out in the middle of the Detroit River on a boat by himself fear that we have to, to overcome. And we've, we've managed to, over the years, um, come up with ways to attack each of those concerns to try to minimize them, but it is a challenge. I would think it would be a challenge every year because it's a new group of kids, a new group of parents, same yeah. old stereotypes. Now, when we talked before, you said primarily your kids were learning to sail. 
So racing at this point probably was sort of a secondary goal. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, every, every year we hope to um, get um, some of our participants to move and take that next step to get involved in racing. And it, the, the difficulty with that is, as you well know, um, being involved in a junior sailing program a lot of the, um, the, the kids that, that excel in racing, they grew up in a family that has a boat, that they grew up in a family whose parents were learned to sail in a junior sailing program, have a frame of reference for it. Not to mention they have the equipment and the, uh, the money and the interest to pursue that. We had zero from that standpoint. So trying to get a group of, of um, young people, uh, one to get the basics down of sailing, and then get them involved in an organized sailing is a, is a, is a difficult challenge. We've we've had some help um, that's really worked well. Wally, Wally Cross at Bristol Point Yacht Club put on a racing clinic for uh, some of our kids that uh, showed an interest and wanted to get involved in sailing, um, but they aged out, went to college, and have moved on and never decided to get back um, involved in it. What's the attrition rate for your kids? If you get a kid, if you get a young student athlete this year, what do you, what do you, how do you, how how long do you keep them? Uh, I guess I would probably say on average um, two, two and a half years where they'll come back. Um, We've had, um, the most we've had, I think, is five years. And we've taken those kids and made them assistant instructors because you know they they learn how to do it and they can they can help uh, help uh, help do that. But yeah, it's it's we we have a a, a, a lot of two year um, and um, and I'd say on average two and a half you know between the entire population about two and a half percent. Two, excuse me, two and a half of them will, will um, return. Do you lose a lot of them because of disinterest in sailing or because the sport, as when you get to a certain point, becomes exp- more expensive than maybe what's possible for your sailors? Yeah, we up until a couple of years ago, two years ago, we were uh, focusing on primarily a team program. So whereas your program and other programs are starting with six, seven-year-olds, we were starting with teenagers and so you really get you know a couple of years maybe three years before they're off to college and they're doing something else and so we realized that was hurting us so but you know we're trying to balance a lot of things the safety issue parents concerns so two years ago we started preteens 10 and 11 uh, and 12 year olds will let, depending upon how mature they are, nine year old in. But that still doesn't give you that long stretch of, of, of uh, participation that can get a kid to the point where they can really work on fine tuning their sail trim, fine tuning their boat balance, and, uh, and, and become competitive from a uh, sailing racing standpoint. Has there been any thought? to where I'm involved a little bit in the lacrosse community and we've done a number of um, programs and seminars and, and camps on Belle Isle. Cast mm-hmm. Tech now has a lacrosse program. Oh, good. There are some very prominent um, Afro-American uh, lacrosse players that are, so they have, there's role models within the community. And some, uh, of the, some of the hurdles we thought would be an issue aren't. We thought cost would be an issue and it turns out it's not. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, there's, you know, I don't know why we think that everybody's got to have a basketball or football in their hands. Yeah. But they're, grow- they're growing the program because mostly it's exposure. Yeah. yeah. And once the exposure, they get that opportunity. So I guess my point, I'm new to this in terms of junior sailing. I was, I ran the program at Crescent last year. I'm a college lacrosse coach, but my point is how many of your kids get big boat experience? And the follow up to that is if you considered taking some of your better kids and maybe working with a local yacht club, that might want to scholarship those kids or give them maybe the, the next opportunity that maybe your club can't provide. Is that something you'd consider? Yeah. And, and we have done, we've on both of those points. 
on moving um, some of our participants over to other yacht clubs that have a more organized program to get them to the next level. We've we've done that with 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 some success and some not so successful. We have <clears throat> uh, had, um, matter of fact, last year, um, one of our um, participants, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name, Red Baron at uh, Crescent. What's his name? Um, the, the boat's name is, I think, Red Baron. Yeah. He's got, I think it's J Crescent. Yeah, one of our- J-110, yeah. Yeah, one of our one of our participants was crewing on their boat a couple oh, times, cool. and um, and we we do have a um, a tartan tin sailboat that um, um, up until the we kept, we keep it at Kings, and um, we couldn't put it in the water last year because it was just too flooded. Uh, but in the past, uh, part of our program would involve. Uh, Taking the taking the young folks out on that boat and showing them how to how to operate a big boat. What I'd like to do uh, once we get the um, the flooding under control and we this is um, will only be our third year at the Belle Isle Boathouse if it happens. Uh, and so we haven't worked out the logistics of bringing the tartan ten down there. But one of the courses that we want to offer is a learning how to crew on a big boat. Um, as a, you know, it, our, our approach, I'm going to digress here a minute. Our approach has been, um, well, our motto is, is having fun while learning to sail. And so we try to let the young folks guide um, their search in terms of what they want to do. We have Opti's 420s, Interlakes, and Flying Scots. And we pretty much, you know, once they get the basics, we let them go explore and do what they want to do, how they want to do it. And because um, uh, stealing from your program, uh, they get a lot more smiles when they're right, they're on a boat that they want to be on right. and doing what they, they want to do. And so um, um, one of my plans for this coming year was to offer for the... Um, young folks that have been through the program a couple of years and have gotten the whole concept of sailing down is to start a, a big boat crew, learning the crew, and then hopefully having them on, um, be willing to participate in some of the weeknight um, DRYA races uh, on, on the uh, Tartan 10. Do you, Again, I'm new to this thing, but you mentioned that you kind of let the kids go a little bit and, and turn. I've been using this term sandlot sailing in, mm -hmm. in reference to sandlot baseball the way we grew up. I played a bunch of sports. I'm sure you did as well. Mm -hmm. And we'd go down to the playground and there was no adult supervision. I've mentioned a couple of times in some of the programs that I oversee, um, we've eliminated parents from coming to practices just to get mm -hmm. them the heck away from the facility so the kids can – I look up one day and there's 150 parents on the sideline and there's 80 kids. It just <laughs> yeah. it shouldn't bring your, your lawn chairs to a practice. And one of the things we're trying to do with, at least from my inexperience, to at least bringing it to Crescent and some of the other discussions is, last year we raced 75% of the time and only practiced 25% of the time. In mm -hmm. what sport and in what world does that formula or model work? It doesn't. Right. So right. We're trying to provide sandlot sailing so the kid can take an opti out, you know, a safe situation under supervision and just mm -hmm. go twirl. There was a kid, there was a little girl last year that went in in a, in a circle and was during our regatta. The mom came over and, oh, my God, what what's going on with my daughter? I said, let her go. She's having fun, but she's not <laughs> racing. Who yeah. cares? You know, yeah. she's seven to eight, nine years old. How could it possibly matter if she's having a good time going in a circle? Yeah. I get I get the point. But I think one of the discussions points, and let me ask you this, I think one of the things I've found from junior sailing is that sometimes communication is lacking because we don't do a, a, a good enough job of telling people what it is we want and what mm -hmm. it is we have. And I'm guessing that in our case, our numbers are dwindling because populations are decreasing, not because there's right. lack of interest. And you're the opposite end of it. You're, you've got bodies, but sometimes it just gets lost in that term communication. Maybe you can speak to... Uh, to those things, do the kids in the neighborhoods that you're involved in do they do they know about your program? Yeah, that's 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 one of our challenges uh, that 
we really struggled with, particularly early on. Um, once we got a, a, a parent or a family involved, they knew about the program, you know, they would tell others or, you know, the, the younger siblings would show up in the program after a couple of years. But one of the common things that we would get was, why don't you tell people about this program? And <laughs> when we're shouting from the top of the mountain, it's just, you know, maybe we're not quite effective in getting the information out there. Um, one of the things that we found is that um, telling people in our community about sailing, um, there's a lot of images that come to mind that, um, that make it difficult for us to get our way through those stereotypes and images of what sailing is, is, is all about. Um, and the whole notion of how we do it, on smaller boats, um, an individual kid running his own sailboat, um, teams and groups. Um, it's completely foreign to how uh, a lot of the people think about what we're doing. So we have to do a lot of pictures. You'll see on our website um, and other things, you know, we really push a lot of, 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 of pictures so the people can get a concept of what's going on. And that does work well to overcome some of that. Does it puzzle you in 2020, we still have those kinds of obstacles to overcome in our own communities? I, that just, my point to it is when you have a young kid that comes to take sailing lessons, you get that big smile, they go home. What's the reaction when they come back to you? And my follow-up question is, what do they hear out in the city that they might not what do they hear that is it is it one of those it's is it teased are they is it i mean what's what's the obstacle interestingly enough i my sense of it and this is all anecdotal we sure i really need to do a better job of doing um research and and um and pre and post surveys of our of our clients and it's just one of those things on the list that, that haven't gotten to. So I can give you anecdotal answers to those, those questions. You know, once they get involved, um, they get a lot of respect from um, their peers that they're sailing a boat. And um, yeah, cause you know, a lot of our, a lot of our kids, they, you know, they show up, they've never been on the water. Uh, had one, one kid, we were, we were on a flying Scott and um, we finally got the sails up, got the boat out and we're, sort of ghosting along and the, the girl I think she's like 13 or 14 she turns to me and says they call me Mr. Harry he says where did all this water come from <laughs> 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 I'm going yeah but um, the most, I, the most babes right yeah that that first that that young person when they first showed up they were definitely afraid to walk down the dock. Um, uh, you had to almost hold their hand to get them to walk down the dock, let alone get on the boat. And so we had to work with them and they get on the boat. But, uh, and it's funny, in that first week, um, in terms of discipline, safety, having them listen to the instructors, there's no problem whatsoever with that because they're scared to death. At the end of that first week, they start getting comfortable. They start understanding what are all those things sticking up out of the out of the the uh, boat and going down into the water and all these ropes and how they all work. And they get their confidence up. Then they start getting a little swagger to yeah. them. Um, and that then they go brag to their friends about it. I've seen some of their Facebook posts and. Instagram post about you know what they're what they're doing, and um, if we can get more of that, I think that'll go a long way towards addressing that issue of this mis mysterious thing called sailing. I have a favorite saying that's it's called "fear is blind," and, mm -hmm. and the point to it is is if you if you're fearful, it doesn't matter who, what, or where you are, it it grabs you where it doesn't, and right. it, it's not. It's it's completely, it's it's not it's not discriminatory at all. It it fear is something that happens to all of us. 
Right. And, it, and your ability to overcome those things, especially in sports, trying something new, trying something different, to be able to have that opportunity. And if you're a mom in Gross Point, Benton Harbor, Marquette, doesn't matter mm -hmm. if, if she can't swim. I grew up in a household. I grew up in a lake and my mother didn't swim and mm -hmm. I was a lifeguard. And, you know, the idea that if I go in the water, we were going to drown. It was just no other way around. Right. it. And you just kind of look and have to get past the discussion. But I remember jumping off the dock was a big deal, eight or nine or 10 years old. And finally, when my, my dad never pushed. And then finally one day he says, do you want to try? Grab my hand. Every, all the kids would jump, jump off the dock. I jumped off the dock and I came mm -hmm. back and I, and I, I didn't die. Right. It, it, but it's that image yeah. 50 years later is still in my head yeah. of yeah. sort of being comfortable and, and, and taking your time and dealing with those kinds of things. And, right. and right. A, a success is based on opportunity like anything else. And right. I think that's right. part of that process, which brings me to, do you guys follow, I know we use, and again, I'm kind of new to this. We use sailing, yeah, U.S. Sailings 101 uh, as a basic Bible for right. process. Do you guys have a, a system that you use or is it just sort of what you Oh, do? yeah, U U.S. I mean, it's, I, my, my background, I retired from Ford. I, at one point in time, I was running their executive development center. And so I got a background in educational training and development. And one of the things that that helps in that regards is realizing that you don't need to invent a wheel if the wheel has already exist. And U.S. Sailing's done a wonderful job of putting together a curriculum. Uh, they've done a wonderful job of training instructors with the certification program and the Red Book. And so we just follow that 100%. And it, it helps, you know, I get volunteer instructors. We, we have a um, a number of volunteer instructors and we have a number of instructors that we pay. I'm trying to work towards a model of, of making all of our instructors past participants, but we're not there yet. And so we have a lot of adult instructors. Um, um, most of them have U.S. sailing certification. They're, they are paid instructors. Uh, others who have years of experience sailing our um, volunteers, but the one thing that the U.S. following the U.S. sailing curriculum does for us very well is, yeah, I tell them, I said, you know, look, we've got young minds that we're molding and shaping. Um, you may have your favorite term for, for example, tacking or coming about or whatever you want to call it. Here, we use the terms that are in this learning to sail right. So read the book. Those are the terms you use not prepare to come about, not um, all your other little terms that you love, they're fine. We don't want to confuse one. So that curriculum has been uh, really helpful in terms of us being able to put standardize our program and make it work. And in the wintertime, I come out of the uh, U.S. ski team racing program. I'm a USSA coach with, for, in the Midwest. And language is something we talk about all the time. And I have a coach, there's a coach in, up in Calumet who is a, a junior slalom central division coach. If mm -hmm. it takes me six words to describe something, he can do it in three. Let me give you a small example. Two years ago, the U.S. national team program came out with angulation as part of the discussion. But you had to postulate your angulation to make sure that you could make the left or right hand turn. And I've been using the same term that I learned from Bob Vile, which is put your toe down. Just t step on your big toe. Uh -huh. you step on your big toe, you put pressure on the inside of the ski, and it turns, right? <laughs> so the three words of push your toe down makes it a lot easier than me going through a paragraph of angulation and showing you pictures yeah, right. of all the engineering process of those kinds of things. And I think when I moved to Crescent, I, there was parts on my boat I thought I knew the name of them. And mm -hmm. even with the experience that I've had, I what's that thing called? Well, it's <laughs> we're going left, we're going right. <laughs> I understand sailing has to have a variety of vernacular to get through it. But mm -hmm. when you're telling kids and talking with kids, you make the language as simple and as concise and direct as possible. Right. Because right. they understand it better. It's just that simple. Right. It doesn't take, you know, the more you talk, I watch coaches and all of a sudden if there's a huddle with kids on a practice field, if it lasts longer than 20 seconds, the guy talking is talking too much. Yeah. He's not oh, yeah. picking it up. Move. No one's paying attention. Yeah, which goes back to the sandlot process of let the kid get in the boat under supervision and go in the bay 
and just see how the boat works without having somebody bark at him right. and he's not doing right. everything perfectly. Yeah. And, and if the boat tips over, he's in three feet of water. Right. So, right. but how do you handle your kids that can't swim? What do you do in that situation? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting, uh, it's right. When I, when I first got involved in the program, like Cliff Papin, who worked with getting the program organized with me, we were talking about, um, structuring the program and i said you know i'm a little bit nervous about teaching young people to sail uh, um so you know let's make sure that they know how to swim and he said well you can do that if you want but you won't have any participants yeah and he was right so so what we end up doing is we have a swimming assessment right it's not a test but we when we were at Keens, uh, we used their pool. Now we use the beach at Belle Isle. It actually works better because that's the water they're going to end up in when they tip the boat over anyway. So we we get them um, into their swimsuits. We have we take life jackets with us. Um, we have them uh, two uh, of our instructors sort of position themselves fifty yards apart and tell the kids, you know, you get from that person to that person the best way you can, preferably with your feet off of the bottom. And, you know, some struggle, some can't do it whatsoever, but what it does, it gives us an ability to see which one's fearful of the water, which one do we really need to keep an eye on, which one doesn't know what they don't know and has no fear. And those you have to keep an eye on too. And then we put them in life jackets and let them do the same exercise with life jackets on so they'll see how the life jackets work. And uh, first couple of days, you know, we, we've got to be mindful of the non-swimmers, their fear, and, you know, continually remind them that you got a life jacket on. You know, we go through a first day, we put up, we get everybody on a boat so they can get the what's this whole thing of sailing about so you go out on the first day either on by yourself on a boat or on a flying scot or however it it works out um and we we really stress the what to do if someone falls off the boat what to do if you fall off the boat um and reinforcing the fact that you know that life jacket is going to um keep you keep you safe keep your head above the water We've got a safety boat out all of the time who's shadowing the boats on the water. You know, we'll get you out of the water immediately. Don't worry about it. And, uh, you know, we had a, so that's our approach. Okay. We had our sailing, we had our swimming test on the first day last year, and it turned out to be the first week of, uh, their, of our program was relatively cool, low mm -hmm. 60s. Water temperature was at 53 or 4. And I asked a simple question. I said, what's the standard for U.S. sailings, putting kids in the water and giving them tests? And one of my instructors, college kids, said, "Well, if there's no ice on the on the water, then you know, then we swim." <laughs> does that work? How does that work out for these these eight, nine, and ten year old girls who literally weigh seventy pounds? Right. You know, the the joke I said to the girls all the time is, "Is they got to run around in the shower to get wet." So you jump these young ladies into the water, and hypothermia is going to set in a lot quicker on them than some oh. fat guy like me, to say yeah. the least. You know, <laughs> and we kind of said, "Well, let's not." put them in the water until we certain we get to a certain temperature. So we looked up U.S. sailings criteria and there turns out there is some, and we mm -hmm. didn't sail for, we, we, we didn't put them in boats for the first couple of days in some cases, because the young ladies, were, you know, as they're coming out of their feet in the water, they're shaking and they're visibly, yeah, yeah. you know, hypothermia before they'd even gotten the water. And, and, and right. I think you have to take consideration that, you know, fear plus the coldness can, can, you know, be a disaster for a, for a 10 year old. Right. That's, a, that's now, advantage of our program starting in July. Okay. That's what I was going to ask you. So yeah. when do you guys start and maybe explain how long your program is and maybe explain a little bit about the pictures behind both of us. Um, I'm, yeah. I think the picture behind me is, is the actual docks where you guys are at. Am I correct? Yeah. 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 I was, I was going to comment about, about that. What was your first question? Explain what, oh, the program. Is, when do you start and maybe go through yeah. the administrative, how do you, how do you get involved in, in registering? Yeah, we, we, you, you, you register at uh, www.challengethewind.org. Um, and um, um, the um, program this year, the program's planned to start 
um, basically the first week and right after the 4th of July. And we have a morning session and an afternoon session. And we'll run those through the entire month of July uh, and into, in, into August. Um, I do want to talk about the adult program. We can get to that in a minute. But Absolutely. That, that um, um, that's that's yet a second part on the but on the youth program. Um, yeah, you go to challengethewind.org and uh, there's a place to register and pay online. Um, and then we'll we'll typically try and have an orientation picnic. It's just more of a celebration, get people out, have a picnic, and have fun than any real orientation um, at the beginning of the class. And then we have a graduation ceremony. Um, at the end of the class, the pictures, uh, the one behind you is, 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 I sort of chuckled when I saw that because Over. that's, that's a docks where we keep our, um, our, our flying Scots and inner lakes. Um, and if you're familiar with the Belle Isle Boathouse, um, let's see, to, to the um, left of the picture, is some a body of water that's a little canal that runs in front of the boathouse between Bell Owl and the Allen that uh, the boathouse is on. And I, I remember when one of our orientations, one of the parents showed up and said, Oh, so that's the area you're going to uh, teach the kids to swim, or excuse me, teach the kids to uh, sail. I said, No, that's the area where we dock the bigger boats. We teach them to sail out there. And I pointed to the Detroit River. His eyes got big as saucer. I thought he was going to take his kid and leave. <laughs> and then his kids have turned out to be great sailors. But he was just absolutely shocked because he was thinking that the little canal there was the area we were going to be teaching them to. Uh, to um to sail so that's the picture uh of the bell Isle boathouse behind you um and the allen that it's that it's on to the left uh to the right excuse me you can you can see a, a sliver of the the uh, bell Isle bridge now if you look at the picture yeah there you're pointing at it there you yeah, it's pretty good there it's, uh, <laughs> good spatial relationships <laughs> behind me is the continuation of the bridge and it's the area that we do most of our sailing in um if you can you can faintly make out there's the leftovers of the old docks that were in front of the Bella boathouse and it, and it forms a really nice l-shaped sailing area and we have our floating docks right behind me below me uh, where we keep our opties and our 420s. And we basically use that area to teach the kids, um, uh, particularly the preteens on the, on the opties, how to sail. And the good news is with the river current, we have the, um, um, the, uh, the dock area there that sort of creates a bay. And we've dubbed that Bay Opti Bay uh, because that's where the opties sail. And then um, up going towards the Detroit Yacht Club is the, um, um, uh, are some more docks. And um, there's an area there where we do our new 420 sailors. And um, the Scots and the Inner Lakes, they go all over the river uh, to, to sail. So that's basically the, um, the area. Um, before we run out of time, I would like to talk about the Detroit, the Detroit Community Sailing Center. Yeah, please do. Okay. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we um, realized with our youth program was, you know, every year we had to raise a lot of money to um, keep our fees low and cover our costs. And we knew that, you know, it really wasn't something sustainable. So we started looking at, like I mentioned, the, um, uh, how do we expand the program to make it sustain the youth program. And um, one of our board members, Larry Breskin, um, has been our treasurer. He's been involved with the youth, youth program long, longer than I have, actually. He's also a past Commodore at the Detroit Boat Club. And he and I got to talking about, particularly when it looked like they were getting kicked out of the Edison, where they were ran their program, their adult selling program, about maybe us trying something new. 
And I had been talking about you know, Detroit Community Sailing Center for a few years now. And so we decided to um, use the, uh, the Detroit Boat Club's adult sailing program and the existing youth program and create this thing called the Detroit Community Sailing Center with the same mission that the youth program has of, of making the Detroit waterfront and sailing more accessible to people that um, don't um, think that they would ever have an opportunity to, uh, to do it. And, and you know, the, the Detroit Boat Club's business model works perfectly for that because the model is get involved with boating and sailing without the, um, um, the challenges of ownership and the time commitment. You know, it's sort of turnkey sailing if you're a member. I'm curious, do you run into the same problems with adults and the obstacles that you do with kids, or is it easier with kids? Yeah, we, I, I can't answer that, and the, and the reason is um, we put out a press release in January that we were creating this Detroit Community Sailing Center. Up until that point in time, the Detroit Boat Club was primarily running its sailing, adult sailing program the way it traditionally as right. this year was going to be the year okay. that we would start recruiting the parents of our participants and their friends to, a lot of them had been asking about adult sailing. So we don't have a track record. This little virus thing came and sort of disrupted okay. all of our uh, plans. Anecdotally though, just curious, cause you obviously talk to people. Do you see mm -hmm. the same obstacles with adults that you might with kids or is it easier with kids? Uh, well, um, I think it would be um, um, the less of an obstacle with adults. I think it's more creating an environment where they feel comfortable and welcome right. as opposed to um, having their parents <laughs> um, overlooking, you know, the safety of their kids. They're making a decision. There's a, I mean, there's a, there's a um, African-American ski club in Detroit. Uh, Jim Danny. There's an, as, Hmm? Jim Dandies. Yeah, exactly right. And I, um, I there's a, a, a huge bicycling community. So there's the, the whole notion of, and there's a camping group. Yeah. Um, the whole notion of folks don't do that um, is pretty much an old stereotype. So I don't, perceive, I don't perceive that we will have an issue with that. We're also trying to target in our adult learn to sell program it's a lot of young folks that are moving into downtown and you can only um, occupy your spare time on those uh, beer bicycles for so long you start wanting to do something else and we hope to be able to attract them into our adult sailing because we're trying to make it we're not we're obviously not there yet we, we haven't even gotten started yet but what our longer term objective is, is to make it almost, uh, it's an overused term, but almost like an Uber where you can get on a, you know, once you learn how to sail, you can get one of our boats and take it out anytime, you know, you want um, and make it easy to, to do it um, um, and, and get uh, more of an opportunity to get some of the young folks that are da living downtown now or working downtown out on the did you pick up some of the fleet from Edison, some of the small boat fleets from Edison that they were selling at the time? Is that where some of your, is that how the expansion of your, of your, um, no, fleet? what, where we, where, um, we, um, we pretty much expanded our small boats, the 420s and the Optis through the, um, uh, the generosity of the, um, Gross Point Youth, um, Nautical Education Foundation. I think Brian Garrity was talking about yep. their scholarships on one of yep. your programs. He's a, he's on their board. He, Jim Morrow and uh, Ted Everham and, and uh, Wally Cross who's on that board have been absolutely wonderful in helping us get boats. We also, other people have donated boats to us, but the lion share of our Opti fleet and our four, all of our 420 and Opti fleet have come to them. So our fleet at Crescent grew by, I think, three or four boats 
this past winter because there were some boats that were put back in some weeds. You're right. we made some suggestions that they cut the weeds and we found some boats as well. Yeah. Kids, don't, kids don't want to use those boats because, well, they're a little old. And I asked some people who know about fiberglass, do those boats float? Well, yeah, they do. They float just fine. Well, but they're not as fast as the new ones. And I said, okay, well, we've got good racers and we've got not so good racers. We put mm -hmm. the not so good racers in maybe boat 15 versus boat one. And we put no right. boats to make it simple. You want to sit on the shore or do you want to be on the water with a right. slow, right. slower right. boat? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. that concept, it was like I had just invented cheese. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was, it was amazing that yeah. you now have, I think, 15 or 16 or whatever we've got in terms of 420s and then a ton of optimists. Some of the optimists we had to get rid of. We had a fire, you know, and just because a couple of them were, were not in very good shape. <laughs> but it's, it's opportunity. And, and once they get the opportunity, it's, it, you know. Right. It, the but Detroit Book Club picked up some of the um, um, Edison, I think, uh, Flying Scots, so they've increased it. We we right now have enough boats to get done what we need to get done. Our big challenge is going to be on um, getting our instructor pipeline firmed up more. Like I said, I want to I want to move towards having younger instructors as opposed to. Uh, nothing wrong with experienced sailors as instructors, but um, the young folks relate better to people that are closer to their uh, yeah. to their age, and it's the model that most of the junior sailing programs have been using for uh, um, for years. Um, so that, as well as we do need to do some maintenance on our boats and our equipment, so we have a lot of needs there. So a little commercial, if anybody's looking at donating time money materials um you know go to our website you can donate we're 501c3 um and we'd be happy to um, um help you figure out a way to help a struggling program i guess the last question i want to ask harry is um i think i said something earlier about jerry lewis being right when we talked about being selfish because it's the feeling we get from what we do to volunteer i don't think that that's mm -hmm. too far from being accurate that said, what, what makes you, what drives you to make you happy? Well, I'll say Jerry Lewis was, 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 was right because what makes me happy, I mean, it's a non-paid position, so I'm certainly not doing it for the, uh, for the money. If anything, it, and I'm, I'm one of those contributors to making the program work. But what makes me happy is, you know, when I see the faces on a young child who – as I recall, when they first showed up, they were scared to death of even going close to the water. Now they're out cutting up on an Opti or a 420 and talking trash with someone they're trying to beat going up the river or down the river. And it just brings a smile to your face to know that uh, you can make that difference in a person's life. And it's just a joy to, to watch the transformation and yeah, you know, I've always said I'm I'm hoping I'm planting seeds that will grow in the future for future boaters and, and the like. I um I think that's terrific, and I think being a volunteer is, is as good as it gets. And when, you know, it just it makes you it makes you feel good. I had one anecdote I wanted to share with you. This past year, we had a regatta. We had some kids in the water, some you know little boys and girls, seven, eight, nine, ten mm -hmm. years old. They're getting a little too far, and they were just kind of. I said I tried to figure out to get them back. So some of my instructors are standing about, and I said. To the kids, come here real quick. And they said, yeah. I said, you guys got to be really careful because I said, DNR is using Lake St. Clair as a habitat to make sure that they can grow fingerlings, these little sharks. They're not going to hurt you, but, you know, they kind of, they nip at you a little bit. And I said, it's not a big deal. Just got to make sure you don't go too deep. And those fingerlings can't come within 12 feet of shore, just so you know. So stay in that 12 feet. And I said, there's like, an, you know how they have electric fences for dogs? where you have no fence and all of a sudden the dog will stop because he hears the sound. I said, all the way around the lake, the DNRs put in these fences so these sharks can't come any closer. Oh, okay. <laughs> like structures are looking at me like I'm out of my mind. Kids stayed where they were the rest of the day, never had a problem. I'm going to the parking lot. Mom stops me. She says, excuse me, you're the, you, you, you're the guy running the race. Yeah. She says, can you explain to me tomorrow uh, what the deal is to make sure that the kids are safe from the sharks? <laughs> This is an adult. Yeah. And he said, ma'am, do me a favor. Think that through for a second. No, what are you doing? To I said, ma'am, a second time. Think it through. Think what I just yeah. said. 
And she goes, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, let me put it to you this way. I said, I was a referee for a long time, a college referee. I'm a coach. And I said, there's 80, there's 18 rules in the Federation book that covers all of sports. And I said, here's the 19th. 19th is Norman's law, which basically says, I'll do whatever I got to do at the moment to talk, to deal with the moment, to take care of the issue. <laughs> and if we got a live cheater steal, I said, ma'am, I'm sure someplace they've got a hybrid of a, of a freshwater shark, but there's no such thing as a freshwater shark. Yeah. And she talked for a second and she thought for a second. She goes, but are the kids safe? Yeah. <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. We're going to do all that's possible to make sure they're safe. Yeah. She walked away, not knowing if I was sarcastic, yeah, or yeah. crap, whatever it was. But there were still kids at the end of the season that were telling other kids <laughs> that like St. Clair was full of <laughs> fresh water <laughs> sharks. But if I kept them safe and closer to the shore, I guess I did my job. <laughs> I to thank you so much for, uh, for having the conversation uh, with us about your, your organization. All that information will be online. And uh, you can, as you see at the bottom of this, all of the um, addresses for uh, the websites are, are available. I would encourage anybody that's uh, interested to certainly check out the, the websites and your programs. This is one of the best conversations I've had since I started this program, and I've been, had a chance to interview Dennis Conner, and I've had a chance to interview <laughs> Gary Jobson and some serious heavyweights, right? Yeah. This is just one of those, this is one of those cool things. Company. This is the cool <laughs> part of this is that we're bringing – we're, we're trying to bring more kids to sailing, which is really ultimately right. my goal for our club and what we're trying to do with, with other things. And this is just another sliver. So I just, I want to tell you how much uh, this conversation has meant to me and, and it's been a really fun opportunity. And, and I'm hoping we can get a chance to sail this summer. I think that would be really cool. I'm looking, looking forward to it. And thank you a whole lot for the opportunity. This has been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed the conversation with you. Take Thanks care. again.